Um, and uh, uh, they, if you don't know what a rally is, I'm not talking about like a political rally. I'm talking about those little tiny cars that they take and put big wheels on them and souped up engines and super shocks and they jump them off of hills and they go on road, off road, sometimes in the water. I mean, these, this is a rally race, okay? And so the, this, the Portuguese rally race has 19 stages. Okay, and we're not talking about like a, like a three mile stage. Or, or, or this isn't like a 30 second thing. This is, this is like, like you go to NASCAR, it's like a 500 lap race, you know? Can you imagine 19 immediately following each other 500 lap races? This is the Portuguese race. It gets out on, on race 16, the, the, excuse me, on stage 16, and, and it, you've got to complete each stage to go to the next stage. But on stage 16, the leader of the race crashed uh, about um, a quarter of a mile before the finish line. He got up out of the car and said the car was just too front heavy. He hit a, he hit a hill. I saw this on YouTube. Uh, he hit a hill. The front of the car was just too heavy. As he hit the hill, the car nosedived down and plowed. Um, anyways, uh, why am I telling you this little story? Because have you ever come up this short of the finish line? You know, have you ever, you ever been taken out of the race about this close from the finish line? I mean, you walk up and you're not happy about that, are you? Man, I was, just, I was this close to the finish line and why couldn't things have gone my way? Or, I mean, that's one extreme, but then there's the other extreme. Have you ever gotten this close to the finish line, gotten so frustrated, so upset, that you just got up and gave up? I'm done with this race. You're this close to the finish line, and you get up and I'm, I'm done. That's it. My race is over. I would say we've probably been on either side at one time or another. Man, I, I, I believe that, that it is so tragic to come up this short of the finish line. Say we're story, studying the story of Jericho, a one-timer. A one it's my first one-timer all year long, okay, because I've been doing series. Today's a one-timer. We're going we're gonna to package it all up in one day. But, I mean, it's kind of like the walls of Jericho. Have you ever come up against something that you could not overcome? A wall that you could not climb over or go through or go under. What did you do? Did you march around the wall? Shouting at the wall to come down? Did you give up? Did you go home? Story of Jericho. Joshua, chapter 6. And I may call, it's a little, little heads up, a little warning. I may call Joshua Jericho a few times before I'm done. Okay, but right now it's Joshua chapter 6 and not Jericho chapter 6. So let's turn our Bibles over there. And uh, if you have your bulletins, there are a few um, study notes that are in there as well. If you can keep up or carry on. Um, first 20 verses, kind of a lengthy section. A little, little bit of it is repetitive. But let's, let's listen up to the Word of God. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Joshua, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the, tree, with the priests blowing the trumpets. And when you hear them, sound a great blast on the trumpets. Have all the people give a loud shout. Then the walls of the city will collapse. And the people will go up and every man straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priest and, said to, and said, to, said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of them. He ordered the people, Advance, march around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people and to the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, plowing their, blowing their trumpets, and the ark of the Lord covenant followed them. Then the armed guard marched ahead of the priest who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the people, commanded the people do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. 
So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the people returned to the camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and in the rear of them followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day they marched around the city and they, mar- uh, they marched around the city and returned to the, to the camp. They did this for six days. And on the seventh day they got up at the break of day, at daybreak, and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day they circled the city seven times. The seventh time, the city, excuse me, the seventh time around, the priest sounded the trumpet blast. Joshua commanded the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all its and all that is in it is to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies who were sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring, a, bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you, you will make the camp of Israel liable to the destruction and bring it on it. All the silver and the gold and articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into His treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, and the sound of the trumpet, and when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in, and they took the city. Wow. Let's pray together. And Heavenly Father, I just ask that during this, this time and these few moments that you would... Um, well, that you would bring down some walls in our lives. We're sorry for the times that we've tried to bring them down ourselves. Sorry for the things we've tried to force open. But today, Father, we just ask that you would join us in this space. Fill us with your Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I met with some uh, wonderful people this morning, uh, early, early this morning, and we prayed, and that was our prayer, dear Lord. Dear Lord, please fill us during this time. Uh, you know, we, all, we already have all of the Holy Spirit that we're ever going to have. But today, I pray that we don't let anything block that. Because I believe that there are some people in this room that have, well, we've gotten used to pew living. You know what pew living is, don't you? We're sitting in one. And God's calling us. And I believe it's a simple call today. I'm going to say it now, and we're going to say it at the end today. God's calling us one more lap. One more lap. Are you ready to go one more lap with the Lord today? Or are you are you comfortable in your pew? Because today we're not going to be comfortable in our pews. Pews are not bad things. We, we've had these pews for a while and they give us a place to sit. But all I'm saying is some of us have been doing, been doing more sitting than marching. And today God may be calling us to one more lap. Um, wonderful story. Man, these people got got together, marched around this wall, and shouted at it, and it came down. I mean, this is one of those stories that you hear as children, and you go, that's my God. You know, that, that, that's the God I love. I mean, it's like a superhero story, isn't it? This is like, wow, this is amazing. But uh, uh, as I've been studying this week and reading it, I think we've got things, some things confused. Uh, let me say that better. Because I, I project my needs on everybody else. I think I've got this story confused. Um, if you read verse 1, if, you, if you'd been tagging along through the first six books of the Bible, Jer- Joshua here now, the people of Israel were exiled. Do you remember that? Um, they, were, they were held in slavery um, in Egypt. Uh, Moses comes out and they are freed and they come and they look out over this new land that God has given them Twelve spies go into the land to see the land. They find it flowing with milk and honey, and they find it flowing with giants. Um, They come back, and ten of the twelve tribes tell Moses, we can't go in. There's giants in there. Let's just stay right here in our pews. Okay? And the, um, the other two spies, Joshua being one of them, said, no, if the Lord is with us, He has given us this land, and we can take it. The only problem is they didn't listen to the two, they listened to the ten. And so they wandered in this small tract of land for 40 years. God was still over them. 
They were still God's people. The blessing and anointing hasn't left, but they stayed in their spot. Uh, Moses dies. They go to go into the promised land. The first city they come to now here, Jericho. Huge walls. Why has Jericho got huge walls? Jericho, did, did you know? I know this. This is news. Jericho did not come with huge walls. They had noticed that there were a group of, of people that were wandering around. And, and we think this is like, like a nation away because we think we're an isolated nation here. Uh, and so we're like thinking they were wandering around in Europe. This is like the distance from here to Anger. Okay? They, we've got this entire nation, hundreds of thousands of people, wandering several 15 miles away or so in circles, following this pillar of fire and smoke and amazing things, miraculous things, were going on in their midst. You don't think that some people had heard the news and kind of made their way over to Jericho. You seen those people? They just keep going in circles. What's going on with them? Have you seen those people? The miraculous is around them. And you know what those people in Jericho thought? Well, what happens if they ever come over here? So they built up a wall so that the people of Israel would not come into their city. And it, 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 sounds, it sounds right. I mean, really. You see the miraculous work of God today, what do we do? We call it fanaticism. You know, it's, it's too fantastic for us to believe. We call, it, we call it unbelievable, impossible. We shame it. We say that that's not, that, you know, that spirit feeling is just not right and, and dismiss it. And we build up our own walls and our own lives for other personal reasons why we don't think God can do the miraculous among us and we shut Him out. So let's, let's tear some walls down today. Who needs a wall torn down today? Well, um, and we're going to use this wall for many, many, many me metaphors. All right? But today, I want to let you know that there are some walls that you can't tear down. I mean, you, you might want to really badly. You might even have the skill and ability to take it down brick by brick. But there are some walls that God it was only designed it's Himself to take care of. There are some places that we should not scale without the miraculous work of God in our lives. He wants to take the wall down. We don't need to go climbing it. The people of Israel had in one way caused this wall to go up. And no one could come in and no one could go out. It sounds like our spiritual lives, right? We build up a wall to keep God out. We, we, don't, we don't believe. I mean, we get, we get comfortable in our pews and we don't want to move from our pews. You guys aren't comfortable in your pews, are you? Some of you with back pain are going, no, I'm not. Uh, but we build a wall up. And you know what we do? We stay there. We don't go in and we don't go out. And our spirituality resides in this space. Can, can I give you a little hint? Now, I believe we can have awesome encounters with God in worship. And we have, haven't we? We've had some really powerful encounters with God in worship. But I believe that the miraculous is held when we go and take His Word to the least cared for. I mean, think about Jesus. When, when did His miracles occur? Was it in the temple? When, when did His miracles occur? Was it out there in the muck and mire of the world? finding people who needed the miraculous. Uh, that's all I want to say on that for a few minutes. The, the, nobody could go in. Nobody could go out. There's this city. This is the city that those ten spies would have looked at and said, we're done. Let's go back. You know, we can't do that, Lord. We can't do that, Joshua. Um, and so, let's just give this one up. They come up, look at verse 2. They come up to the city and the Lord said to Joshua, when God speaks, it's important that we listen. The Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. There's a huge problem for us when our perception doesn't match up with the promise of God. So Joshua is told that see, 
see this city, it has been given to you. And what does he see? A city with a huge wall around it. What would you think? Lord, we've got a problem. There's a huge wall here. I don't know how I'm going to get through here, but you said that this city has already been delivered. We have a problem when our perception doesn't match the promise, don't we? What do we do when our perception doesn't match the promise? But let me tell you a simple, simple principle. The promise of God always comes before the victory. The promise of God always comes before the victory. If he wants the victory, he's already claimed it, proclaimed it, grabbed it, built it, defeated it, whatever it is. He's already got the victory, so it makes perfect sense that he can proclaim it before he goes and gets it. Now, this is only a work of God. All right, this is talking about the future today. This isn't prophetic word. This is the statement. That city's already been delivered into your hands. Can't you see that? Yes, I can. And there's a city that God has already delivered to you. I don't know what your city is. I don't know what your walls the Lord needs to bring down. But I want to get real specific because we just spent four weeks, excuse me, three weeks talking about Cain. And some of us have a sin in our lives and we keep offering God unworthy sacrifices. And maybe today that wall is that sin. That impurity that's in our life that God wants to tear down. Maybe for some of us, that wall is some, some other conflict that Satan's got a hold of in our lives. Maybe it's your job that you're not happy with. Maybe you've got a, a, a problem in your family and you want that wall to come down. There are some walls that you can't come down, but who takes them down? The Lord God. And so I would say, let's stop trying to scale them and let's see what He can do with our walls. All right? Um, the, he's, he's already given them the city. Um, they have uh, the promise. Um, now, we get the promise in modern Christianity, and we do something quite unique. We have the promise. We know the promise. And we... So, this is a, a checkered flag. What are checkered flags used for? The finish of the race. Now, I'm not a NASCAR fan. Oddly enough, my family, we used to live about, you know, 30 or 40 minutes away from, uh, it was only like 15 miles, but you had to meander around the mountain to get there, to get to the uh, Bristol Motor Speedway. Um, and it was, I mean, it race, race weekends came up twice a month, twice a year, and you wanted to move out of the country when that, when that occurred. Not because of the bad people, it was just so packed and busy everywhere all the time. But anyways, at the end of the NASCAR race, they waved the, checkered flag. Do you know they wave the checkered flag for every single car that, fe- that goes across the finish line? Because you know what those, those, those flags did? These, you know what those racers did? They ran the entire race. They made it all the way through. So, you know, it's the Bristol 500, whatever. Then it's 500 laps that they made it through. Um, you know, it, and that's just swell and all. But we've done something quite unique in, in our modern Christianity. We want the... Uh, we want the flag to, to go on in our life, but we don't want to run the race. We want the finish line victory, but not the 500 laps. It's time for some of us to go run the race. We've got the promise. The promise is secure. We don't have to worry about the victory. It's already been given to us. But God's calling us to run the race today. He has to some, give me some specific instructions to give... To these people, of course, they're supposed to march around the city for six, excuse me, six, once a day, one time around the city for six days. They have a certain order. They're supposed to uh, allow the, the, the ark to go, the priest to go, and then the people follow. And there's supposed to be no noise the first six days except for the trumpets. Well, you ever wonder what the trumpets are shouting? You ever wonder what song they played? You know? Now, this is our city, or, or maybe some victory chance. We will... No, they're not doing that. As they go around the city. But, you know, that's the... Wherever, I, this is what... Because we, we want to metaphor that today and say, well, that's our worship. You know, we're worshiping God around the city. I don't think that that's what that was. I think that was just the simple proclamation that here's God. 
Because the trumpets went around the ark. And maybe that's what we need to start doing in our lives. Maybe that needs to be our proclamation. Here's God. That's all I've got. And that's probably the best thing that I can do. Here's God. I can't change your life. I can't do a whole lot for you. I can help you out. I try to be a good servant. But there's God. Come see God. Maybe that needs to be our song too. They go around and they march around six days. Can you just imagine? I mean, these, these guys have been wandering around the wilderness for 40 years. I mean, they, the old generation had all died out. These are all young men. You know what young men want to do, right? They want to prove that they're young men. They can do anything in the world. I bet you these I mean, they were ready to fight. They were ready to take. They, would, they were wandering for 40 years. Now they're ready to take the promised land. They're, they're tired of, of, of relying on the past, and they want to take their future. Can you just imagine, you know, soldier comes in to his wife that morning, has his uniform on, I'm ready to go to war. She kisses him, I'm so proud of you. Uh, and he said, I'm so ready to go and defeat that city, Jericho. We've got a plan. We've got an awesome plan. And they go, and he goes off and comes back home. His shoulders are a little bit down. You won't believe what we did today. We just marched around the city. That's all we did. We didn't even get to pull out our swords. We had to sit there and be quiet. Because you know what Joshua did, don't you? He got the word from the Lord and gave it to the people. There was no, hey guys, let's sit down and have a business meeting on this one. You know, we, we, need, to, we, need, to, we need to set up a few committees to study the impact and the financial responsibility of taking Jericho. Let, let's put our, let, let's, let's call, let's circle the wagons now and let's, let's see how we're going to know. God gave him a word. He delivered that word to the people. You know what the people did with the word? They carried the word out as it was prescribed to them. And they go and they go and march around the city one day. They come back. Soldiers got his shoulders down. Come and march around the city another day. Soldiers got his shoulders. You can't believe what we did. We just marched around the city. Third day. You know what most of us would do on the third day? We would give up. He would say, you know what? I can't fight in this war. I'm going to go home. God can't give me what I want. I'm done with this. Let me tell you, don't fall short of the promise of God. Don't come up this short on the promise that He's already given you victory for. They made it around six days. Don't stop on day number six and say, that's it. I'm done. God hasn't given me what I wanted, so I'm going home. Because maybe, just maybe, we're so focused on that wall that we haven't taken a look of the inner character work God's trying to do in our lives. Let me, let me tune that in for you one more time. We get so focused on the outward victory that we miss the inner work that God's trying to shape in us. God, you haven't brought that wall down. I'm going to go on home all the time missing the Savior that He's trying to shape inside of us. But you know what happens, right? They march around the city six days. They're faithful people. They come back again. And they march around the city. And the walls come down. But we think they're shouting to the walls. No, I think they're shouting for God. The walls did not fall around Jericho because the people shouted. God already promised that the walls were going to come down. They just got to play a part. The, the shared community got to share in the victory. Man, please tune in on this one, because this is, we're going to go back on this one. The, the shared community got to share in the victory. Can you just imagine, there's probably some Israelite soldier who gave up on day number three, but there's some faithful, you know, the more spiritual ones that are really excited about marching around the city. They think it's cool to march around the city. And they go, come on, buddy. You want to come and join us. We're being faithful to God over here. You know, and, and, and they go and they get the unfaithful ones to come and join the faithful ones. But you know what happens when you put the unfaithful with the faithful? They get to share in the victory. You thought I was going to say they were going to mess it all up, didn't you? No. Because when you bring the unfaithful to the faithful, and you start sharing the faith together, then the people who get to share the faith get to share the victory. We've got people all over here who need walls to come down in their lives, but they don't get to share in the, the victory because nobody invited them to share in the faith. 
It's time to go out to some of our fellow Israelites, if you would, some of our fellow uh, North Carolinians that are just right outside these doors and invite them to share in our march around the wall because we already know in this house that God has delivered the wall, but we want to invite some people to join in the journey of faith so that they can share in the victory that we already know that's coming. I mean, look around you. There's an empty pew next to you. Empty spot. You want to grow this church. You want to see this community change. Start bringing them to share in your journey of faith. I'm gonna, my family's going to invite others to share in our journey of faith. But God is calling you today to invite somebody to share in your journey of faith so that they can share in the victory that you already know about. Today, you're going to walk out of here in just a few minutes. You're going to get the opportunity. You can return to life as normal, or you can go get somebody to come back to March tomorrow. There's one small point here I want to, I want to carry out. What was the first thing that went out in front of all the people? The Ark of the Covenant. You remember what it carried, right? The tablets, the copies. The, it's the sequel, though, because... He destroyed the first ones of the Ten Commandments. The, the rod of Aaron. Do you remember that? The rod of Aaron went in there. Then there's this brand new thing that just recently stopped. That holy jar of manna. The holy jar of manna is in there. And this represented the presence of God. And so the presence of God went before them. You know what was the first thing to enter the city once the walls came down? The ark. Do not go somewhere in your life that God has not already gone. Don't try to scale the wall by yourself. Don't try to bring a wall down that God's promised to bring down. Definitely don't try to bring one that God wants you to leave alone. But you always follow where God is going. So if He's just marching around, you keep marching around until He takes the, the wall down. You, do you, did you read how the Scripture said that the wall was brought down? I've been waiting to do this all week. Flat with the earth. And I'm a, you guys know I'm a literal reader of the Bible. So when the walls came down, it was like they were stepping on the ground, the flat earth. They didn't have to step up and get over. No, because this was a total victory from God because God doesn't give partial victories. He gives a total victory. And they come up and they step, and it's just like stepping on solid ground. That wall was so flat. God's calling us today to march around His wall, to be faithful to Him. Don't stop short of the promise. Don't give up because of the inner, don't give up the outer work because He's trying to do inner work as well. I've got one more flag I want to show you today. I'm so original. <laughs> this is a white flag. and If you watch NASCAR racing, you know what the white flag stands for, right? What does the white flag stand for? One more lap left to go. I'm not going to play with that. One more lap left to go. Man, you know, you, 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 know how, you know who the white flag goes down for? Every single racer that has gotten to the last lap gets the last, gets the flag. Every single one gets to see the white flag. If you didn't make it there, you don't get the white flag. If you, got, if you wrecked out, if you crashed out, Whatever it is, you gave up, you parked your car. And trust me, you can Google it. There are NASCAR racers who went in the pit and just said, that was it, I'm done. Don't you wish that life had a white flag? That you're looking at your wall right now and you say, all right, one more lap. You're almost there. Don't you wish life had that white flag? One more lap and you're almost there. Your victory is almost in front of you, but... But life doesn't have that, does it? That is not our measure of faith. Because my laps don't win the race, my laps don't get me victory, I just follow in faithfulness. I, don't, I can't stop short of the promise because I haven't fully reached it yet. And we're not done with the journey. And I believe that some, some of us have gotten tired of waiting for the white flag to go, wishing that our walls would come down. And we've given up on God We've given up on our journey. We've given up on sharing our faith with people and inviting them to come and share in our journey with us. And this, this is our lives now. 
We, we're okay with just marching around. I don't have to do anything if I just be quiet and march around. I'm okay. But I, I believe today God is saying a simple thing. Do you remember what I said? I said it at the beginning. I'm going to say it one last time. Brothers and sisters, God's calling you to one more lap. Get up. Come join the journey. Come join the march. Come on, because those who get to share, those who get to share, get to share in the victory today, God's calling you to one more lap. Will you get up and come and join Him for one more lap? Now, I promise you, one more lap is going to turn into a million because you'll see the promise. But today, God's calling you to join Him for one more lap. Join Him for the, the faithful journey of one more lap. I'm going I'm to pray in just a minute. And you're going to have the opportunity just within your heart and your relationship with God to say, God, I gave up on my journey today. I'm going to join you. I'm sorry that I gave up, but today, one more lap, God. I'm going to go around until you bring the victory. Some of us are looking at that wall and you don't have the strength for one more lap. I'm with you. Today I want you to claim the promise and look at that wall and remember, God brings you total victory. And if He wants that wall down, He's going to bring it down. He is always faithful to you, so don't you stop short of His promise. Let's pray together. And Heavenly Father, we just, I just pray for my brothers and sisters that are out here that need to see their walls come down. Lord, bring our walls down. Lord, for those of us who stopped short of the journey, help us to, to get back and, and join the race one more time. Call us today, Father. Do your work inside of us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You, you respond as however the Lord has led you. If you need to come down and pray, you want to come and talk with me.